Welcome to Bespoken Bones with your host, Parvani More, connecting ancestors, sex, magic, and science. Parvani explores transpersonal tools for erotic wellness every new and full moon, engaging educators, healers, spiritual leaders, and scientists in revolutionary dialogue. Get ready to feel good and go deep. This is Bespoken Bones. Hi, and welcome to Bespoken Bones, Ancestors at the Crossroads of Sex, Magic, and Science. I'm in the business of healing trauma. We're connecting with our roots, and we're developing radiant erotic wellness in past, present, and future generations. And I am your host, Pavani More. I'm super excited about all the emails that I've been getting from folks, um, engagement, you know, telling me how the podcast is landing for you, suggestions for podcast guests, the questions, um, lots of folks stepping into the ancestral healing session work. Want to just give a shout out to Anna and to Eliza and to Selma um, with thanks for the suggestions for guests. That's super awesome. And just hearing a lot of how the podcast is rippling out in, in these healing waves and really inviting folks to keep in contact. Uh, it's super nourishing for me to hear how it's landing for you and to know that it's, um, you know, having positive impact in the world. So please keep in touch. Also super um, happy to share that uh, Taya Shear and I, uh, who's another ancestral lineage healing lineage practitioner, um, are going to be offering uh, an ancestral lineage healing intensive in Berkeley, California on November 30th through December 2nd. And so the workshop is three full days of ritual and transgenerational healing. Uh, we'll be walking through the ancestral medicine pra- uh, process that's laid out in Daniel Four's book, Ancestral Medicine. Um, and you can expect to be engaging with your blood lineage ancestors in ritual through prayer, song, visioning, group dialogue. Um, you don't, there's no prerequisites for the workshop. Um, and it's super accessible for folks who are either new to ancestor work or are adopted. And especially for those who have uh, really tough experiences of family and feel really disconnected from ancestry, uh, this is a great opportunity to step into it. Uh, and the trauma, the the training, sorry, the training is going to be trauma aware, um, held in a multicultural ritual container uh, that really connects the ancestral engagement and cultural healing. And so if you want to register, uh, you can go to my website, which is transestralhealing.com, and you can find more info there. So today, it's my absolute pleasure and delight to introduce you to Lindsay Sadaikis. And Lindsay, I hope I'm saying your last name right, and please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Lindsay uh, Sadaikis. Sadaikis. Great. Thanks. Okay, cool. Uh, Lindsay is a educator activist uh, in the practice of wonder and is based in New York. And she's also a former Catholic nun, a current lover of humanity and all that is, and she's an aspiring mystic and improviser. And you can find her current work as a ritualist and alchemist at omniasancta.org. I'm going to spell it. It's O-M-N-I-A-S-A-N-C-T-A, omniasancta.org. Beautiful, beautiful name of a website. Lindsay, so welcome. So happy to have you on Bespoken Bones. <laughs> Thank you. Stoked to be here. Yeah. Big, big fan. That's great. Tell me a little bit about um, the work that you do in the world. Well, I a little bit about the work I do. I think I guess I would call call it as like maybe just divine love. You know, really trying to embody divine love in spaces um, where I happen to land. So whether you know it was like in a convent or in a classroom or currently like in ritual with people. I think um, yeah, just navigating the world that way, really just meeting people where they're at, you know, whether it's the human heart that's before me or the group of 12 hearts and souls that are before me. Um, I draw, it's a jarring because I think I don't, sometimes don't think about it totally as work, <laughs> you know, because it feels, because the word work can be so, um, the connotation of that. So it, it feels more like an invitation that I've been given and I'm like responding to this, like love, which is divine, which is really a, a great, a, a real blessing. Yeah, I, mean, I I resonate with that and really like being present. It sounds mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. what's in front of you. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. So, I mean, most recently, you know, I was at a school in Greenwich, Connecticut, um, 
in an international baccalaureate school called Whitby, just like it sounds. <laughs> a great school. I loved it. It was a real um, blessing to be there for three years. Uh, and I taught a course called Individuals and Societies, which was amazing. <laughs> it's like democracy and, you know, civic engagement and um, peace, like nonviolence. I, I was able to craft the curriculum pretty much as I had wanted to. And so I, it was a lot around like ethical transformation and activism and uh, and the kids are awesome. So I taught sixth grade and then I did eighth grade um, this experience called Community Leadership Project, which is like a typical kind of capstone project. But I tried to make it much more culturally relevant uh, and honest than some others are. So, yeah, and coaching basketball at that school and cross country and boys baseball. Good times. So <laughs> that was my most recent my most recent gig. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, it's it's interesting. So when I go back, when I think about like who is my first spiritual teacher, uh, mm. like who I identify as that is uh, Dr. Maria Montessori. And oh uh, uh, wow, it was the first Montessori school, Whitby, in the country. <laughs> oh wow, I didn't yeah. know that. Oh my god, wow, that's amazing. in the states. Yeah, yeah. wow, so, wow. Like, I I I just you know that that commitment to radical education, to, oh. right, to being outside the dominant paradigm of um, how we are conventionally educating our children is like so dear to my heart. Uh, wow. Likewise. That's amazing because the school would be, so it's a fusion of like a Montessori school, 18 months to up until second grade. And then it's an international baccalaureate school from first grade, first grade to eighth grade. But it's, I mean, all of our lower school teachers who are incredible, you know, the Montessori school is just but I hear you. It's so the unconventionality of it. Um, yet, yeah. yet, it's, yet what's funny is it's actually so humane. <laughs> so Montessori education is actually it seems to be much more humane, right? Like much more um, in line with how we were in, in, invited to learn as inquirers and exploring, you know, and touching and tasting. And, you know, uh, so it's it's funny that we call that unconventional because I guess it's probably the most conventional if you're using the word in the right way anyway yeah like really that commitment to um sensory experience and i i mm. want to, you know i when i learned about your work and um was thinking about having you on the show and just got super excited about this um talking about ancestors and education and how those things go together because it's it's not um you know it's a little counterintuitive right uh and you know, when I think about the education system that um, is kind of the the current, you know, what's currently in public schools and stuff like and how that was set up, like who set that up? Right. Mm. How did that get established? Um, it just reminded me of the um, you've probably read or heard of Don Taylor Gatto's work, The Underground History of American Education and and kind of how um, how our education system was based on a class system that was set up out of uh, the industrialist model, right? That was like really creating a society in which you had um, classes mm -hmm. to, to sustain the rich, right? And so mm -hmm. our, our, our education system is modeled on a system of productivity and management that yep. really divides totally. into classes, right? And so like, I just started right. thinking about like, oh man, like those are some like, like when I think about those, like the coal barons, like those those fuckers mm. who like really like entrenched capitalism. That's in right. This country and then like set up this like public mm -hmm. education system, like kind of it looks benevolent, but it's really, you know, it has pretty nefarious. Yes. Intent, right. 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 Like, oh, man, that's some that's some ghosts. You know, those that's are some, a, like those are not ancestors. Those are ghosts. Who yeah, you're, <laughs> right? it's so true. I haven't thought about it. I mean, just as you're speaking, I, I guess I, I also hadn't thought about the connection between the ancestors and education. And there, this woman, Jean Anion, I took this course in graduate school and she would like knock your socks off. The course that I took was called Teaching Jean Anion because she had since um, she had died, um, yet is so present in so many ways. And so one of her best friends, colleague, Wendy Luttrell, sent, taught this course to all these PhD students in urban education at, at the Graduate Center in um, CUNY in New York. And um, it was you know, precisely what you just said. I mean, Jean Anion was like unpackaged the reproduction of the class system in our schools. I mean, and it's like worse now than it has been, <laughs> you know what I mean? And like, um, and I was, I'm grateful that even just as you presence class, because I, I recognize 
you know, I think it's uh, certainly intersectionality is a big part of any sort of activism. But I, I notice, you know, race will be presence. And, I, and I'm eager to have like race and class and gender and, and all of it to be presence, but class specifically, right? Because it feels like we don't go there. You know, like I feel like growing up, I'm 37. Had I been reading the Communist Manifesto, it would have been like, I mean, it, it'd be more permissible for me to like say fuck, you know, like around the dinner table or something. And even when I read the Communist Manifesto in um, in grad school, I felt like I was like doing some rebellious, <laughs> you know, annotating the text, you know, because it's I, I just feel like um, class had just it had such a dirty taste in our mouths to get like my with my generation because of and like the Cold War and um, and like no one was talking about it. And so for me to learn about this woman, Jean Anion, and to so rigorously like dove into all of that and unpackaged it. And it's just so obvious, you know, she's not even really I mean, it's not like it's up for debate when you start learning about it. Um, you just even the zip code. Right. Just go there. <laughs> like how, you know, how our kids are born into a certain zip code and then that's where they go to school. And then based on that, that's where they work. And then. You know, they're like being little laborers for the global economy. We're like training and educating laborers for the global economy. Mercy. And like there's no sense of like bread and roses and like wonder and like laughter. You know, like what if there was a course in laughter? Wouldn't that be so great in class? Don't you think? I mean, oof, I, and, I do think. Yeah, you know, I mean, or in erotic sure. wellness, Pavani. I mean, when you that phrase erotic wellness, I can't. I mean, when I heard that, I'm like using it like it's my job. I'm like the intellectual property belongs to Pavani, you know, but I, I mean, because it's like, oh, it actually does. Oh. I just need to like, I yeah. got that phrase from uh, M. Kali Hashiki. Oh, so, yeah, word, that's, her, that's her phrase. So it's her oh, property. Oh, yeah. so good. You know, and it's like because that I mean, you know, when you think of what's going on in schools, I mean, nailing, I mean, they're just being trained to be little workers, you know, and that, or, or being trained to be the CEOs, you know, it's like, yeah, oof. classism yeah. 101. Totally. And so there's, there's a, th there's a thread here that I'm tracking of, mm. um, well, two threads that I want to, that I want to bring in. One is around sensuality mm -hmm. in education that I think I hear you naming of like, mm -hmm. oh, if there was this, if we were curating, this sense of wonder, I mean, mm. that, that would like seriously, I mean, it would really, like, what would happen, you know? What would happen? And that's <laughs> just it, right? Because like if, if if young people or people our age or people are, are elders, if once we're smitten by wonder, you, I mean, you nailed it. It's like, then what does happen? We don't know, right? There's just such an unknown and you can't like co-opt it. You, it can't, you know, wonder isn't about like dotting your I's and crossing your T's. It's like, that's just it. You're like, if you just go commune with the Redwoods, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or just like go dive in the ocean or whatever people are, you know, you earth around your land or how, how, whatever, however it is that you access wonder, there's no telling what might come. That's like the beauty of it. But where do we have, I love how you use the word curate because it's like, where are we curating spaces for to simply be astonished? That's one of the questions I'll ask friends of mine. I'm like, when were you most recently astonished? Like even our listeners right now, like, wow. Right. I'm like, are we, are we cultivating that in our own lives? And I think if we do, then it's such a game changer, you know, then you are so, um, there's, you're just, there's a lot more bliss and not a bliss that's like, um, ignoring all right. of the it's systemic like injustice, bypass, right? Yeah. At yeah, yeah. all. And actually it's, you know, the wonder piece I was noticing, you know, you know, identifying as an activist and certainly being a proponent of agency for, you know, all these years, I was noticing there seemed to be a, a vacancy of wonder, you know, like as I'd be protesting, you know, it's like, and you, when you look at, you know, I love like Henry David Thoreau's like on civil disobedience, you know, which certainly, you know, the boys, the recent MLK that they were certainly influenced by, you know, uh, it's, I just, there seemed to be wonder in some of the more, some of our other ancestors of the path, if you will, activists, you know, that they did have that. And I think that that propels their activism in a different kind of way, because it allows you to, it's more like galactical view. Like, yes, we need to like, like, I'm surprised. I think you'd be with me that we're not all committing, you know, acts of civil disobedience to not pay our taxes for 2018, for example, right? Like, can't we all just come together? You know, but it's like at the same time, there is the activist piece in the political sphere. But wonder also reminds us of like being anchored in eternity, 
you know, that there is this like this back body of our those who have gone before us and like our progeny, either spiritually or physically, you know, so. It's a both and. It's a both and is, is I think, the wonder and the age. But then you see people who are smitten by wonder who aren't doing anything, right? So that's my, <laughs> right? It's like, listen, it's got to be a both and. You know, we right. love that you're like so astonished deeply and you're like, whatever, but please right. then go impact the world in robust democratic ways. You know, like no one wants to hear you just about the stargazing. I love the stargazing and then like go I don't know, right. you know, do something about it, right? You have to eventually <laughs> get up out of the bed after fucking your lover for days. <laughs> Precisely. Right? <laughs> oh my gosh, I love that you say that, Pavana. I used to, one of my lovers used to say, find the one you want to fuck and like that'll be the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like be, be with the one, be with the one you want to fuck. And that is the revolution. Cause it's, you know, like if it starts there, I love that you say that, but you're right. It's like, have, have, you know, be a great, yeah. Be a lover. Uh, and then, and then and go the change the world and a fighter. fighter. Yeah. yeah. And well, then just, come back to the bed and then come back and be resourced by your, you know, become erotically well. And then like, you'll, you know, your civil disobedience will be that much more profound and like complete because <laughs> you'll you know, be satiated. <laughs> I, um, so the, the reason I'm not a teacher anymore is because I got fired and I got fired, oh. um, because I wrote a book. Well, it wasn't just because I wrote a book, but I wrote a book that was a, it's, uh, it was called putting the edge in education an anarchist cookbook for teachers. And oh. it was really Really, um, it was question putting the ed in education because edge. educate putting the edge, putting the in education. edge. Yeah. but there was this there was you know and it was a lot about like bringing activism into the classroom and you know how do mm -hmm. I radicalize my my practice yes. as an educator and yes um and I'm just thinking about I named M Kali Hashiki mm -hmm. earlier um and I don't know if you know who she is she's a, I don't so she's she's fantastic she was on the show she um uh is a queer fat, femme, black, uh, mm. sexuality activist and educator, uh, also an uh, ancestor practitioner. And she, in, in wow. an interview that I did with her, she talked about like the necessity of bringing Eros into yes. activism. Ah. Right. Yes. Right. Probably that's much. Yes, precisely. Because yeah. there's a crisis. Yes. I can't wait to listen to her, to the your talk yeah. with her. Because I have said for years, there's a crisis of arrows yeah, in education. Yeah. Oh, my. In education and in general. I mean, well, I think, you know, when you look at the word love in general, we're already like... In, you know, not in a good space in English because we just have the word love. But, it, you know, in Greek, there's 26 words for love. And so eros is like this, you know, like the, our erotic, desirous, sensual, like passionate love. And then agape, right? A-G-A-P-E is like a selfless, sacrificial love. And I, I think that what we see is that folks do have this agapeic, sacrificial love, yet they, there's no erotic love. I mean, people, it's like they're slaves going back to class and, you know, corporate capitalism, they're slaves to their jobs, working 80, 90, 100 hours a week. And they're like, it's like they don't even know why they wake up in the morning. There's like no path. Like what? It goes back. I mean, Wonder and Eros are, are, are like cousins, right? They're like best friends, you know, because I think when there's space in our lives for wonder, you then you, you become erotically well, right? Like it's almost like an incubator for Eros, I think. Um, but and I think people are scared a little bit of Eros because it's like, again, you I, I think if we can like cultivate like even talking about erotic wellness, you know, I mean, and and how the two are, I think, come together around Eros and Agape again, like something I do in my in my life, in my own practice is like, I kind of want to take the temperature, the pulse of my relationships, either like collegial or partners or, you know, cousins, best friend, you know, whatever that is there a dimension of eros and agape in this relationship? And by eros is like they're an anticipatory delight. Like I had such an eros, like an anticipatory delight just to, to talk with you and to listen to you and to learn from you, right? Like there's something erotic about that. Like it doesn't mean that we need to be doing other things. It's like, oh no, that's eros. Because like I, I'm like stoked and enthused to like commune with Pavani over like a Skype sesh, you know, and like, that's like a, a holy and healthy thing. Even, even the website, Omnia Sanctus, which was inspired by our ancestors, my blood ancestors, praise be, um, means all is holy, like eros, agape, right? Not, you know, sex positive or folks who are monogamous, you know, education. I mean, just it's Omnia Sanctus, you know, like all is holy. And we've, I think we've, 
defamed or like Eros is like pejorative or something. And or it's just people don't even know, right? That's another good question to ask people. Like, how are you? Like, what do you have Eros about? It's like, uh, my partner. It's like, go, come on, brother. <laughs> come on, sister. Be a little bit more broad, you know? Like, what else gets you going? What else like gets you hot? Like, I don't know, go do some horticultural activity or, you know, right. But you feel me, right. Don't you think? I, I totally do. And I, I think that like the, that taboo of Ugh. anything being erotic other than, you know, my, my sexual partners, right. Right. Of like, right. And, and we talk about this when we talk about ecosexuality, we talk yes. about it. Ugh. Um, right. And so it's like, how do I broaden my definition of what is erotic? And, and <laughs> totally, yeah. totally. But probably it makes me think. So like at the, the first question you asked, like, what kind of work do you do? Like, this is like a great example of like, so when I, the ecosexual vibe, I'm like vibing with big time these days. And so, you know, on Instagram, you can do this little Insta story. So this is like me, like little Lindsay Sudeik is trying to like, like put out to the world some of like what I've been pondering. So I wake up like a week ago and, you know, I go on like a you know, six mile run. I'm like killing it. I'm like, listen to, you know, my mind, like Kendrick's coming on my mind, like be humble, sit down, be humble. And I come back to my space, to my little oasis. And I just like sprawl out on the grass, like total ecosexual vibe. Like I'm communing with the morning dew, the whole thing. But then I put up on an Insta story, my moment about like ecosexual. And I was like, hashtagging it like lover earth, not mother earth. And it goes from ego to to eco, like the whole thing. And it, and people now it's like been great fodder for conversation, you know? So it's like, that's kind of the thing that I'll be up to. It's like, I'll be, I'll feel inspired, which we know the etymological root of inspired is like you're breathing in. And it's like, then how to breathe, who can we, who can we co-conspire with then with something like a concept like ecosexuality that makes us feel so alive, you know? I mean, it's like when I feel like when people learn about that, I hate to say it, but it feels a little bit like knowledge is power. You know, this is ciencia es potencia. I don't, I say I hate to say because I'm not sure where that um, phrase comes from, but it does feel it, it's emboldens people, right? If they, if they can orient themselves to the earth as their lover, not simply as a mother, it like they get to become revolutionized, revolutionized, right? Like they get to become erotically well is my, yeah. So anyway, so fun. I've been talking about it a lot lately. <laughs> Ecosexual. So I good. Love the hashtags. Yeah. Oh, so I, good. I, I, I'm curious, Lindsay, you were a Catholic nun and now. And that's so fun. <laughs> that's, that's, I want to, yeah, because you, you wrote to me, um, I've known for decades how intimately bound our sexuality is with our spirituality. That's right. And I've really tried to embody that. And um, that's right. Like, I think that a lot of, a lot of us know that, right? We, we kind of like know that on the body level. Yeah. Sex and spirit, mm. but like, it's really hard to talk about it without kind of the, the Tantra miasma. Getting totally. Us, you You're know? right. That's right. And so like, ha, yeah, I just was curious if you'd love to speak a little bit about that, that connection. How do you experience that? And maybe even bring in the, the ancestral piece here as well. Yeah. I mean, I think that we're like a hylomorphic reality. Like as in the room, we're the, in the like bodies, spirits that we're in and hylomorphic, right? The Greek for like a body and soul, like we're inextricably body and soul. And so for me, it made sense that like sexuality, like our body, our sensual self and our spirituality are like, you know, bound to one another. So like just as much as to, to tend to my sexuality, you know, like I need to get good rest, for example, you know, then it's like, then the question is raised, well, then how do I like tend to my spirituality? Or like, if I'm tending to my spirituality, then how am I being sure to tend to like my erotic needs or, you know, so, I mean, the question is the same, but I, you know, I think I hail from like the um, Catholic mystical tradition, you know? And so, I mean, the Song of Songs, which is a book in um, the Christian scriptures, it's it was a short book, eight chapters, but it's like the book of the mystics. And like, I didn't know that. I just remember praying with it and sitting with it, in, you know, poetry by uh, in college. But it opens, Pavani, with, oh, that you would kiss me with the kisses of your mouth, for your love is better than wine. And like a few verses later, like, draw me after your love. And a few verses later, my lover belongs to me and I belong to him. I mean, it, you know, the whole, it is like an erotically vibrant text. And, and I remember just like being so smitten with and being, you know, really 
yeah, smitten again is the word I'll use. And then learning, I love Thomas Aquinas and John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila and, um, and have their real ancestors of the path for me. And, you know, Thomas Aquinas gets a bad rap. I mean, people think he's like some, you know, uber orthodox, like, like philosopher, theologian, but the dude was a great lover of, of, of God and humanity and all that is right. And he, um, when he was I, dying. I just have to interrupt you oh. right there because I thought you were going to say he was a great lover, full stop. And I was uh, like, <laughs> period. You know what? Like, That's what we wow. should say. That's what we should say. <laughs> well, as so I know him, as I like, I've like, communed with him or something. No, but I'm sure he was a great lover. I, we should just, uh, that's what I should say from now on, period. You're right. Um, and, but, you know, when he was, so he was a Dominican friar, like this type of Catholic priest in Italy. In the, and when he was dying in the 1300s, he asked his brother friars to read aloud to him the Song of Songs. Oh, that she would kiss me with the kisses of grandma. The whole thing from beginning to end, just on repeat. Like we, how we put things on repeat, like surely people listen to your show on repeat, respect, <laughs> right? Like they were, the, that's what he wanted. That's how he wanted to breathe his last. And he said when he was dying, like that all that he had written would be like straw in comparison to like beholding the face of God and the, and the face of God beholding him. So like he, this great lover. And then and then what does the Catholic Church proceed to do but make him the like preeminent theologian? Like poor Tom Aquinas. He's like, I actually precisely said not to do that. <laughs> right? Like it's actually not about the doctrine. It's it's much more about this gazing of like into one another's souls and spirits and bodies and being held. I mean to be held, like B-E-H-E-L-D. Ugh, you feel me. Um, so I think in the convent, all of this was alive and well for me. You know, I mean, I felt inspired to be there, which was hilarious because I did not grow up in a Catholic home or religious home at all. We grew up much more like secular, amazing, a great family, uh, but weren't like, I mean, everyone was like, you're going to do what? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like enter the convent. And then when leaving the convent, um, also felt, felt called to leave. Uh, and what I find interesting now, like how many years has it been? I guess I've been out of the convent for 10 years, you know, nine or 10 years that now I'm coming full circle, it feels, with the ancestral medicine work, because what I'm noticing dropping more into that work is so many of us uh, who are alive in the world today happen to have ancestors, blood ancestors who were Catholic, right? I mean, it's that's that's the truth of the matter. And folks don't necessarily want to engage with those blood ancestors for a myriad of reasons, because of all the misogyny, because of the oppression, because of the patriarchy. I mean, name your word, you know, mercy. And I say it with a lot of tenderness because it's very real, the amount of wounds that the Catholic Church has inflicted upon folks and their people. Um, yet here I kind of emerge, you know, like, you know, young Lindsay here, who happens to be a former Catholic nun and who is a current uh, practitioner of the Catholic mystical tradition, who's queer and open to the abundance and radical. And, you know, the word radical means comes from the Latin radix, like to be rooted in, to be like, you know, rooted in our ancestors, our people. Uh, and so there there just feels there's like a, a moment kind of waiting to happen that I, I very much look forward to somehow. That's why I use the word alchemist that like life through me, life force through me can, can bring some healing and tenderness period to like all of the, the wounds there, you know, um, in, in ways that are, that are honest and that are mystical, you know, cause the mystical tradition is beautiful as it is in, in every world religion from what I have experienced, you know? So I don't know if that answers your question, but it I, does. And I, <laughs> I, I just want to take a breath there, actually, mm, mm. Um, because I think that what you're saying and I want to and I want to pull it out a little bit because I think what you're saying has actually huge implications. And I just want to make sure that I'm getting it. Mm. Um, I have a, a very, very dear friend, I would say my best friend who uh, grew up uh, Catholic and has I was just with this person and, and has so much trauma around mm. uh, sexuality and gender that really came out of um, Catholicism. Right. Mm. And and so the this piece of that you're bringing in of that it's not it's not all that and that there are um, there's healing support that can be here 
through mm. connecting with this, with the mystical parts of mm-hmm. the tradition. That it's it's like because I think that it's kind of like education, right? We get spoon fed this curriculum, this religious curriculum in Catholicism, and there's there's deeper levels that I think are probably very very life affirming. That's right. Rather than um, rather than so sex negative and so I that's right sex, sexually violent actually. Yes. Yeah. So would you is that is it? Can we just go a little deeper there about that? And oh, you, like you said, oh, there's I'm. I'm wanting this healing moment for this. Could you just mm. like drop in with the medicine of that? Because I think that this is a, actually a, a moment that could reach a lot of people with cultural healing. Mm. Yeah, and it gives me the chills just when you presence um, your your best friend who I think, Pavani, that um, in many ways, the mystics of the Catholic tradition were probably queer. That's my, that's what I have stumbled upon, which makes me a little teary eyed to say um, in recent years or even in recent months, you know, because there was such a could to go back to that idea of unconventionality. I mean, they were folks who were, who were challenging power structures and were challenging paradigms that were really oppressive and ugly and toxic and detrimental and contra human against humanity, you know. And I think I just presence thinking about, you know, the word became flesh is is this verse from the Gospel of John, chapter one, verse 14, which is really what Catholicism like hinges on that whole idea, how the word became flesh. Ergo, our flesh is holy, holy, like H-O-L-Y. And that's another way you could and, and like holy is holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y. H-O-L-Y, right? Like we are these whole people. And and I think you can start to see the layers of why the patriarchy of the church wanted to suffocate the magic of the body, because those of us who have the privilege and honor of being in our bodies know how magical and amazing and mystical and mythical they are all at once. And um, and so shame on the church for trying to squelch that. Yet you see throughout that there are people who are these real beacons of of being in their bodies and their souls, being like owning their hylomorphic reality in ways that were beautiful and honest. And yeah, I mean, Teresa of Avila, too. I mean, just the list, you know, and, and it's and I think the whole like heaven hell thing is just a real tragedy. You know, I mean, Teresa of Avila, beautiful, incredible mystic from the 16th century, said, your love so holds my heart that if there were no heaven, I would still love you with the same love. And that's the utterance that I do also. Like when I read that when I was 25 years old, tears just came down my face because I thought for this is what we are here. It is for love's sake. And like if Jesus were walking around town whether it was like in Carmel, California or in San Francisco or in Westport, Connecticut, like he would be with us and for us and about us and in us. And our, I mean, yeah, Jesus is not, Jesus is not preoccupied. The cosmic Christ is not preoccupied with who satiates us sexually like who how how are we orgasming i mean he has other things on his mind and heart <laughs> like like mass incarceration in this country for example like how we treat our migrant workers for example and it's just it's a real audacious claim that the church and that you know even from the 1960s that like all of this preoccupation with contraception and birth control and who you know being monogamous it's like wow Open wide the doors, please, God, and like let in the magic of erotic wellness. Like what if someone, what if a pastor was preaching on that? Like what if a priest, like a Catholic priest, and I look very forward to sitting and communing with Catholic priests and Catholic folk who are still practicing and who are wounded, you know, Um, uh, because I think it's a, it's all, all of us. And it's not to like be a, um, like a poster child for Catholicism. I, I learned today because I have better things to do with my time. That's not what I'm about. What I said, what I'm about is what I said at the very beginning is just to embody a love which is divine. And and the cosmic Christ is just that, as is the divine feminine. I mean, the how how often Mary 
is interwoven in people's spirituality and, and practice. And, and she's a powerhouse and she's been co-opted in ways of being this like meek, humble woman. It's like, are you kidding me? The woman like was like bold and ugh, audacious and um, fiery and, you know, all the things. So, yeah, but I, I definitely I, you know, I think there's medicine of mine that I carry from my lines, from my bloodlines that is um, able to straddle where people are at and uh, this current moment coupled with like a lot of ancient practice in like Celtic spirituality, let's say, or in Grecian, like Dionysius vibe, like, you know, um, mystery schools and uh, ritual in that way. So it seems like the Catholic mystical piece, right. Or like the Catholicism piece is, it is to use the word like medicine. Like that seems more, um, it's just alive. There's a, there's a, there's a liveliness to it or like a, um, the word like vitality, I guess. Uh, I mean, you know, you've been doing your show and so, you know, kind of the rhythm. So I just, um, it feels like when we got to that point, to that part, like that's when things, when there was just even more of a synergy around what, what other people would want to listen to. I mean, I could talk, I feel you and I could converse, um, for eons about all sorts of things. I also wanted to ask you a lot of questions. I didn't know if I could do that because I, (laughs) I want to just have a conversation more than being, um, than talking. And so, yeah, um, my sense is the first the first chunk you and I would find interesting because we I'm I'm intrigued by you and uh, curious about you and curious to come to know you more and vice versa. Yet it I think as far as from a listenership um, perspective, it's probably like a bit of like okay you know uh, that's my sense just my gut reaction. Yeah, that's great. It's super good medicine. Mm. Um, thank you. And I I just imagine that that's going to be more of what you bring through mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. this particular niche mm-hmm. of um of healing and like it's it's interesting because like you know i have interviewed people from all different kinds of traditions and there's always this this piece of it there's always the mystic piece there's always the other side to the story like in mm-hmm. in you know in jewish tradition um you know in in chinese tradition like there's always the um, the underground um, that's right that is holding the queers that's that right holding the, the gender blessed that's, that's right. holding um and it's like mm. and it's, it's we, sometimes we have to wade through those layers we have to wade through the bullshit layers just like mm. you know um I, i'm just thinking you know my 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 kids did go through public school right and so like the real education was the conversations that we would have about their schooling the mm. critical thinking that we would do about their education and i think it's the same right yeah so totally how how do i get to what's real beneath um what i'm being sold or what i'm being spoon fed like how do i get there and i mm. i just think this like um in in the way that i hold hold it that practicing ancestral consciousness is one way because I definitely heard in the entire conversation that we've been having that we have been weaving in these well and bright ancestors you know oh indeed um, oh entirely and, and holy like of 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 blood but also of lineage that's right um, and so it's like just curious if you want to speak to the practice of ancestral consciousness right and like how that's such a uh, resilience resource Mm. Yeah. Yes. And let me ask a question real fast. What's the difference between the ancestor of blood and ancestor of lineage as you just said it there? Oh, right. Like lineage, like being like the Catholic lineage or the Jewish lineage. Oh, got or, it. Okay. You know. Got it. Yep. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Um, thank you. Such a wellspring. I mean, it, I, I, there seem, I have experienced such a profound like resourcing from dropping in with um, my people, I'm hesitant to say my, I don't like to use that word. Cause it's like, is it my people? It's like always our people, but, um, there's like, and then tending doing like the repair work that then kind of, that will lead in to the, this reverence work. I mean, I guess what I would say is I love the plug that you gave at the beginning. You and Tay, I feel like I want to be there in Berkeley. <laughs> I, so I, did, I was able to do a Berkeley deep dive with the ancestral work with Daniel last January. Um, that then 
led me into being, you know, wanting to be part of the third cohort of being in that practitioner training, which has been, I mean, totally next level. I mean, so profound and beautiful and transformative. And so I keep talking about kind of working with my people and, and, you know, and now my, so many of my friends, like 20 of my friends are now having they're going through the practitioner. I mean, are have practitioners, <laughs> you know, like Shannon Willis and Seta and um, Irene Amar, like different people that. So, how have I been resources? Just being able to drop in with them. I mean, I think just doing moving through how Daniel has revealed it. You know, I I feel like I'm not answering the question, but um, yeah. Let me let me rephrase yeah, it, please. Yeah. Because there's something about like, um, if I'm at the mall, yeah, right, yep. and everything I see around me is saying consumerism, consume this, this is what you need, blah, blah, blah. You know, these are the foods that you should eat, which are like hot pretzels and orange Julius or whatever, you know, <laughs> um, like, and, and so that is just like the reality, right? That's just the right. reality that I'm in. Mm -hmm. And yet, like underneath that mall is you know, through layers of concrete is the earth and, and mm. with like, you know, millions, actually 4.6 billion years of mm. history, mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. and ancestral. Yes. Conflict. But like, all I can see is the shiny, bright footlocker. Like all, I, you know, all right. I can see is the elevators and the chairs and the people and the, the whatever. Uh -huh. Um, And I can't tap in. I forget. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I can't see it. I can't feel it. It's buried, mm. but it's there. And so like, I, th I think that that's really what you were getting at. Yes. Like, and so like, that's the practice. It's like, how do I remember that's right. that the earth is there under the shiny malt? Like, how do I yes. get to the, to that ancestral consciousness so that it can be a resource of knowing what is mm. Mm. right. Mm. Of just being like, yeah, this is an illusion. This is, this is uh, not what is like this yes. Catholic bullshit that's put on me is not what is right. Right. This, right. Is, this is human made bullshit. Right. Right. Or whatever, whatever. I don't mean to diss totally on the Catholics, but like whatever, you know, right. whatever the, whatever Corporate the capitalism. oppression yeah, word. is, it's mm -hmm. like, how, how can I tap, like, remember to tap into like, to what is on the mm. ancestral level. Yeah, just wondering if you have any practices around Oh that. gosh, it's yeah. so I mean, indeed, I mean, it's just so beautiful. I think dropping in in my own ritual space on a daily basis for now 20 years, you know. So I mean, I, I solitude is what I feel like is my my first and ultimate lover, you know, that that is where I am resourced every day of my life, literally for hours for the last two decades. And I, I think when you can drop into solitude and allow that um, to heed that invitation from like the deepest wellsprings of, of our being and, and the earth below our feet and our and our back body, our ancestors, then it's like there's a breath and the way you walk, you just walk differently after the encounter of, of solitude. And so I, I, I use that word because it, it, it feels to be, it seems it's the one that has the most expanse or vastness when it comes to what is right. Cause solitude for me looks and feels very different than it may for you, than it may for, you know, Sata or whomever. And so, um, I, I think I have felt just invited into that and then how to book almost like a lover, right? I mean, you come to know your lover and she comes to know you and you attune to each other and you, you know, sit and sometimes there'll be, you put on music and other times, you know, I, I often always light a candle um, just to be able to set the space. Um, and now bringing in the ancestors, like my blood ancestors of my four lines that I've worked you know, it's just so magical and also so familiar because I've been doing that with the ancestors of my path, like Tom Aquinas or John of the Cross or the Cosmic Christ, right? And so it, it's like, wow, this is so beautiful that now my my people are also here with me. And I think I've had such a profound experience with the ancestral medicine work that then I, again, as I did with the ecosexual, I then share about it with people because it like one of the medicines is like, you know, from our people's an orator and trying to make able to make the esoteric palatable. And so I've I've just been sharing with people that I've been communing with over happy hour, like in the surf, like whatever. And then little by slowly, it's like the waves like rippling out. Um, other people are saying, wait, when I connect with my blood ancestors and do some tend to do some of this lineage repair work, my life is changing. Like I can say poverty in in just like 
you know, December was my first exposure. So just since December till now, me connecting with my, with the, with my people has up leveled my experience of living in exponential, like infinitesimal ways, which is remarkable because I already loved life so fully. Like a year ago, if you and I were chatting, I had like this much enthusiasm and like this much intensity, you know, yet here I am a year later. It's like, I feel my life's work in the world with like a capital W life's work has been crystallized and has been revealed to me through the ancestors, which is like being a practitioner and being a soul coach and, um, and one who leads with erotic wellness and like divinity, right. That the, the two of them together and leads with, with, you know, nobility and, and who's hilarious, right. Like all of that together. Um, so it, I, I think there's a real connection between, one's life's purpose and like realizing for what are they here in this lifetime for and connecting with your people. Like, it seems that they don't, have you had that experience? Do you know what I mean? Totally. Yeah. But I, I think it, it came like for me, it's being revealed as I connect with my people. Yeah, right. right exactly. Like the purpose comes through the precisely, precisely rather than being like, this is my purpose. And now I'm right. going to connect with my people. Precisely. It, it precisely. The other way. Exactly. The other way for me too. That's what, that's what was so amazing. And it sounds like you're also someone who was already, realizing your like life's work pre ancestral it's uh, you know yet when you do connect with your people then it, it just becomes the clarity and the and the ease right and the grace it's like this is unbelievable and so i'm like everybody please go to your people right like i then you know cuz we let's tend to them cuz they're and then just there's so much connection as you know as we know that once we tend to our own people then you do see the macro Right. And, and I can I can really say that, honestly, I there seemed to be something missing from the social justice piece that that is this, you know, like that we weren't maybe presencing the ancestors or doing our own lineage repair work um, in that equation. Lindsay, it's so good to have this conversation with you. And it's been lovely to have you here on Bespoken Bones. I feel such a, um, it's just, yeah, I love the the practice of reverence and awe and wonder uh, as ways to um, to really embody our humanity and that the erotic is, of course, like a major thread in that, mm. in whatever ways, you know, whatever mm-hmm. ways we, we engage with that. Thank you. Grateful. Thank you. Hi, folks. So, in the interim of when Lindsay and I first recorded the interview for Bespoken Bones, um, there's been a lot of information released in the news about the crisis of sexual abuse in one uh, diocese in Pennsylvania um, in the Catholic Church. And so we decided to continue the conversation uh, and add this part on. It didn't feel right to Lindsay to have the interview come out and not have addressed this. Um, So we're doing this part two to really talk about, um, to talk about what has happened and the impact of that. And, um, you know, if, as I'm sure many of you who are listening have some point of access or some point of lineage in Catholicism and you are touched by this and this is an ancestral issue as well, right? That this this kind of sexual abuse has been perpetrated by people in power for millennia and great. So now it's it's visible here and so we have a chance to start to feel into it and what are the cultural skills that we're developing around mm-hmm. receiving impact? What are the cultural skills that we are practicing around turning towards rather than away? And so this addendum to our conversation is really about turning towards the impact, the pain of sexual violation. Uh, and and I guess like I just want to say that there's a somatic piece here of like, opening my heart to feel it and to allow 
what's true to move through me to really to deeply feel the impact, but then also to be able to ground that impact out, right? Because I think sometimes um, when we're faced with abuse of, of any sort, but especially at this magnitude, we can devolve into just a sense of helplessness and despair. Um, and that's not our intention here. Our intention here is to really further this conversation on the cultural skill level of how do we, how do we turn towards? Mm. And um, so Lindsay, thanks for, for doing this. And I know that this has touched a really painful nerve with you and just wanting to hear kind of what your thoughts are and from a really um, embodied place, like what, you know, what are you feeling around this? Mm. I, I love how you share about um, like a turning toward um, and also presencing the ancestors and presencing the magnitude of all of this. Um, I It feels very tender because, well, for a myriad of reasons, but, you know, so many of these men uh, in power, the episcopate, right, the bishops and... Um, all these these priests, you know, they espouse this um, ideology that's really one that's that's very sexually dishonest, you know, for the quote laity, and um, and yet at the same time, here they are um, perpetrating on folks, uh, you know, for decades and and hundreds of years, um, and so it's like I think the hypocrisy. Um, and the exploitation is uh, is fierce and is uh, is tender. And so, in the spirit of like, how do we repair and not repeat? You know, and I say we just mean the collective we as like a people. You know, um, yeah. So, yeah, you know, it's interesting because I what I hear in what you're saying is like, what is our collective responsibility mm -hmm. turning towards? Yes. Like mm -hmm. how because like it's not like they weren't known about it's not like you know there's like there's a collective um consensus decision to turn a blind eye right yeah. and and it's it's unspoken it's not like we all get together and we're like oh let's let's not talk about sexual abuse just right. like oh I can't, I can't bear that impact and mm -hmm. so we have this cloak of, of secrecy and silence which of course allows it to perpetuate right and to fester right i wonder when when i use that phrase like sexual dishonesty it, it's like you know the quote episcopate and like quote church teaching you know especially you look at it like in the last hundred years but always has, has been around when we talk about um eros and desire and erotic wellness and the flesh and our bodies and you know, um, you know, the church has taught uh, something I think that's very dishonest when it's about that only folks who are, you know, practicing natural family planning and are, you know, married and are monogamous and are heterosexual can engage in the fullness of life with their erotic self, you know, and, um, and that ideology is going to have consequences. And, and now we are seeing in an even more lived way with like data points and facts and broken hearts and broken families and, and so much trauma that has been inflicted upon people, like it's imploded. Like that ideology has imploded within itself in very explosive, traumatic ways. And so I, I think how can we lean toward is say, okay, well, if if Catholicism actually contingent is contingent and like a mystical Catholicism is contingent on the word becoming flesh, which is a line from the Gospel of John, you know, chapter one, verse 14, like the word became flesh. And and like if in fact, you know, the cosmic Christ came so that we could have life and have life in its fullness and in abundance, which is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, 10, all of that includes our flesh. I mean, the cosmic Christ wants us to be erotically well and emotionally healthy and intellectually honest and spiritually aligned and all of that to be lined up. And and it's it's like some of my like righteous anger comes from how dare you all of these men who are, quote unquote, celibate 
espouse this sexual dishonesty a paradigm that only folks who are you know, married, natural family planning, monogamous, heterosexual can be erotically well and have life in, in abundance. It's, it's like mercy. And so how can we like have the paradigm shift to go back to some of these like mystical understandings of our Catholic lineages, which come from Christ, which are like about our flesh becoming on fire and, and well and healthy and, and indulge, you know, I mean, so I, I guess it's like i'm a i'm a firm believer in the sense of like actions have consequences in, in a in a way and just like in like law of gravity type stuff you know and and here it is like they have espoused this you know something that's not congruent with reality you know it's not congruent with reality to to mandate that 99.9999999% of us are not allowed to be sexually intimate, you know, erotically well. It's, and now here we have all of these hundreds and hundreds and thousands of thousands of souls and and bodies that have been exploited on at the hands of these quote unquote celibate men. I mean, it's mercy, (laughs) you know, crisis. Yeah. So, but I, I want to turn toward with hope and optimism toward like having life and and having life in abundance, which is why I even wanted to engage some more around this, right? Poverty is like, I really want to be a conduit of folks having a full life, you know, like a, a life full of wonder and full of beauty and full of magic. And like, that includes their hearts and that includes their bodies and their arrows and their imagination and their spirit. You know, it's all of us. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're naming as part of, you know, as a representative of Catholicism is the wound of betrayal, Mm. which is like, in my understanding of sexual violence, it is at the heart of it, right? The heart is shattered by this betrayal of how could you, like, how could you do that? How could you take this thing of, of such intimate beauty and how could you do that with it how could you pervert it like that Mm -hmm. and yeah and I think that that um like how do we be with that that -hmm. betrayal I remember after um after the election Mm -hmm. uh as a white person and and I I felt so um like oh my god how could this happen right and my black friends being like well of course this could happen this is happening all the time and like just that my eyes were then open to it, you know, mm-hmm. like, and, and I think it's kind of the same here. Mm-hmm. Of It's like how our understanding of the potential we all have as humans, right? I have that potential to do that. Mm-hmm. If I was in, in power, I, you have that potential. We all have that potential, right? And it's like, how do we get really honest about that we all have that potential and we all have choice. Right? Mm. All those priests made choices. Like and the people who the the bishops who, you know, repurposed them into other communities also made choices. Mm-hmm. Right? Like those were intentional choices. We as a society have a tendency to protect perpetrators. And especially when they're white men in power. That's you know, absolutely, our our, mm. our whole society is set up to protect those people in those positions of power. And so it's like, we actually, you know, one of the things that my somatic coach says is it takes a village to harm a child, mm. you know, and it's like, we, we are complicit. Like, I didn't harm those children. Absolutely, I did not do that. You did not do that. And like, there is a complicity of like, what was I not willing to pay attention to mm. what was what was my role in this and and i you know i use that like in community when we're in community with each other like we always have roles whether or not we're willing to look at our role right and that doesn't mean we made those choices to do those things but i want to mm. i just feel really like like what i have domain over is me and like all right so how you know in what ways was i 
choosing to look away? In what ways was I choosing to like not feel? Was what chooses was I choosing to numb out mm-hmm. you know, when when those things happen in my communities? Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And how can I deepen my capacity to be with those things, to turn towards those things, to feel those things, to let that mm-hmm. that impact really impact me? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, beautifully stated. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons, as I'm, I'm sure you are too, is almost as I know you are, right? Like uh, being a person of prayer and dropping into a space um, where just your heart can open up that can weep with and lament with, right? Um, and 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 even dare I say, you know, like with the victims and the perpetrators, you know, I think the betrayal piece, yeah, is the crux of it. And and I also and I I totally hear you and and concur about we we protect especially white men in power from, you know, blowing up their spot and exposing um, the 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 violence that they um, inflict upon folks and. Um, I think the severity of, or like the gravitas of the betrayal here is um, these same folks who are perpetrating um, are on, you know, Sundays and every day of the week espousing an ideology that is very oppressive and very, uh, I would say, abusive to, to be, to, to tell folks, uh, you know, to espouse an ideology around sexual dishonesty, right? And I, it's like, have felt complicit in that myself, right? That um, when you when you talk about complicity, I think how, you know, I've come a long way in my own journey and my own evolution around what it means to be to live life in its fullness and in abundance, you know, and and to 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 live a life of sexual honesty and emotional, intellectual, spiritual congruence and um and so now i i feel can felt complicit because i've said i have we used to be of the camp that oh only certain folks are entitled or quote allowed to be engaged sexually or intimately with others and and i've spent the last you know seven eight nine years trying to uh, turn that around right um or even i don't know 10 years even still when i was in the convent of saying um you know how can we be, how can I not, no longer be complicit, but rather be the antidote to this, to the abuse and to the systemic injustice? It, it's like, okay, well, allow me to use my itty bitty influence and sphere of influence to speak about um, congruence and, and holiness in ways of uh, everything from orgasming to your you know, solitude as lover to your, the possibility of your imagination to, you know, the whole spectrum of our, of our humanity and of our uh, lived experience with even things, especially things, not even things that are, that are non-human, you know, that are other than human when, you know, uh, like Shakespeare is that line, one touch of nature makes the whole world kin. And it's like, just how to have a more open hearted experience of life on her terms, which, um, I think is what any mystical tradition is really about. And so I, it's way on my heart to recognize my complicity in espousing, uh, an infrastructure around sexuality that was very oppressive and, um, and painful for, and, and untrue ultimately, and, and not congruent with what is. And that's really where, you know, I think the church has a lot of blood, if you will, on her hands, um, her, cause folks refer to the church as like Mater Iglesia, right? Like the mother, mother church. And it's, you know, they are not espousing what's in, con- what's congruent with what is, you know, and, um, and, and I can think, I, can I just interrupt you for one second? Totally, please. Yeah. Cause I just, I heard something really important. Yep. Um, I heard you take accountability mm-hmm. for your part. Mm-hmm. And I just don't want that to get swept under here yep. because I imagine for folks who, I mean, not just I imagine, I know firsthand as someone who has experienced sexual abuse, how meaningful it is 
to have what happened validated. Mm. To have someone say, that happened, and I'm sorry. Mm. And I just wonder, is like, is there anything, you know, when you really drop in, if you take a minute and just like, what needs to come through you right now to folks who are listening, who may have been wounded by the church? Mm. Oh, I think just um, like sentiments of, um, you know, of saying I'm sorry, you know, I, I'm i reluctant to say I'm sorry because it's, I mean, that phraseology um, doesn't always uh, work for me personally when it comes to uh, healing and things. Um, and what just what comes to mind and heart is like, like anyone who's listening, I wish I could like embrace and hold like um, myself included, uh, who's been <laughs> perpetrated in a ways mercy. And so, uh, um, and hold almost like that. And what comes to heart is the scene between uh, Robin Williams and Matt Damon, you know, in Goodwill Hunting and, and like, it's not your fault, you know, and like, it's not your fault because so many, it's not and just, fault. I would, yeah, it's not your fault. <laughs> and like, I just wish I could hold, I have like a somatic, like warm eyes to warm eyes and warm hands to warm hands moment of, you know, and, and be in that pain and, and say aloud, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. And, and I'm sorry. Um, and to be gentle with ourselves. Uh, you know, I've tried to be gentle with myself with regard to some of what I have um, personally experienced at the hands of some folks uh, in the church. And uh, I, my hope and a prayer is that folks can be gentle when, when they have to um, reckon with the abuse of power that's been done to them hmm? uh, and to somehow be emboldened by it and not defeated by it. I want to say thank you for initiating to come back on to talk about this. Mm -hmm. um, I want to also offer to folks who are listening and who are moved by this and to really reach out, reach out to me, reach out to others. Um, that it's really through community mm. and through being witnessed that we do heal and just love, love to everyone who has experienced this. And love that's, you know, well, beautifully, I think that fear paralyzes and love moves, you know, so it's like, yeah, beautifully stated, like to... Mm, and so beautiful about it's so I think that folks do heal when they're witnessed, right? Um, I think in prayer, even I don't know if that's your experience of prayer, but like I have experienced a tremendous amount of um, like solidarity with folks, you know, like the capacity to just kind of witness with them, you know, like folks that are moving through what it is they're moving through. And I, and I think I, I don't mean prayer is like the only option. I think you, I think I'm a big believer of action and protest and civil disobedience and all of it. And I just think prayer really can, it's a really transformative space, you know, and a place to bear witness, right? Um, and there's a reason I've, I'm 37 now. And since I was 17, I spent a couple hours a day, like in solitude, prayer, whatever you want to call that. It's, it's like, because I feel very deeply as like a lover and um, oh, just the tip of the iceberg for so many folks, right? In so many ways, not just the crisis of the Catholic Church, but just in so many ways. Yeah. And if you would like to learn more about Lindsay's work, you can go to omniasancta.org. I'm going to spell it. It's O-M-N-I-A-S-A-N-C-T-A. -A -A omniasancta.org. 
So I just want to thank everyone also for listening to our conversation. Um, it's been really inspirational for me. And if you have also felt inspired by what you've heard, um, you can be in contact um, uh, either on the bespokenbones.com website or on the transestralhealing.com website. Um, love to hear how it's landing for you. Um, mm. And so I am Pavani More, and I will be back every full and new moon with more embodied goodness and ancestral wisdom. Mm-hmm.